Thanks, Michael. And I'd like to thank Sharon Kay for inviting me here today and also for putting together such a great program. I think it's been a very uh, interesting day and I've learned uh, quite a lot. Now, you've been hearing some stuff in the previous session about big data, so I'm just going to get you to revise your expectations all the way down because I'm going to be talking about some very, very, very small data on the role of ECMO uh, as it's emerging in the treatment of massive pulmonary embolism. I uh, have a couple of disclosures. Uh, Mackay, uh, now, now Gatinga, Germany, and Physio Control, now wholly owned by Stryker, have uh, supported some research that we've been doing on ECMO for refractory cardiac arrest. Now, the idea of mechanically supporting patients with acute massive pulmonary embolism is not new. And uh, in 1953, an American surgeon, John Gibbons, developed the, the first uh, successful use of the heart-lung machine in open-heart surgery. And the story goes that he was inspired to do this because he had, he had a patient some 20 years beholdhand that had a massive pulmonary embolus after a, a cholecystectomy and died, and they attempted to do an open emb embolectomy without extracorporeal support, and the patient succumbed. So he spent the next 20 years developing the first successful heart-lung machine. When we're talking about uh, developments in cardiopulmonary bypass, they don't get much simpler than being an arterial ECMO, and this is the basic circuit that we use to support patients that have had an acute pulmonary embolus. It's peripheral veno arterial ECMO. You put a big catheter in the patient's femoral vein. You suck the blood out of the patient with a centrifugal pump, pump it through an oxygenator, and return it to the femoral artery. It's a very simple way of bypassing the heart and lungs, decompressing the right ventricle, decreasing pulmonary blood flow, and providing a systemic flow retrogradally up the aorta. This can be done pretty much anywhere. This is a patient that's being cannulated uh, for ECMO in a peripheral hospital uh, in, New in New South Wales. Um, this can be done in your intensive care unit, uh, in your ED, cath lab. And we have mobile teams that operate out of uh, Prince Alfred Hospital and St Vincent's Hospital that will come to your hospital and do this for you if you ask them nicely. Heart-lung machines have obviously come a long way as well. This is the cardio heart pump that we use uh, for ECMO cases. Uh, it weighs about 10 kilos. This little red box here is the oxygenator. There's a, a centrifugal pump that's integrated between the oxygenator and the pump. Uh, it's got a sort of two-hour battery backup. It's got integrated uh, hematocrit and saturation monitoring. It's a very, very sensitive and um, very uh, sophisticated piece of equipment. Um, and the circuit's actually rated for 30 days of continuous use, so it it's, should be a single-use item uh, for these cases. So what are we talking about when we're talking about acute pulmonary, massive pulmonary embolism? The widely accepted definition is a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 millimetres of mercury for more than 15 minutes, uh, or a patient requiring inotropes that's had a, an acute pulmonary embolus. And I want to present with a case that I think really sort of highlights the, the value of, of uh, veno arterial ECMO. This patient was a 50-year-old guy that had a recent diagnosis of a DVT. Uh, he was started on some aspirin by his GP. And he actually presented to Prince Alfred Hospital with bilateral leg ischemia due to this, which was a paradoxical embolus that was occluding his uh, aorta at about the level of, of uh, L2. So this was a paradoxical embolus that arose from a massive pulmonary embolus that crossed through his heart, and I'll show you some more pictures of that later. He had massive bilateral pulmonary emboli as well. This is an embolus here, almost occluding his uh, right pulmonary artery. And not too surprisingly, he was in bad shape. There wasn't time to thrombolize this guy. He was deteriorating rapidly hemodynamically. There was no cardiac operating theatre immediately available. So he went to theatres to have an emergency aortic uh, um, embolectomy and... Uh, uh, SMA embolectomy, which was also involved. Uh, intraoperatively, they managed to unblock his aorta, but uh, again, unsurprisingly, he remained severely hypotensive despite the use of high-dose inotropes uh, with a worsening metabolic state, a pH of less than 6.8, uh, severe hypoxia, and uh, a lactate of 9. And at that stage, they called for ECMO support, which could be provided uh, very quickly because there were surgeons available in hospital at the time that could provide it. So to establish veno arterial ECMO, in this particular patient, they actually had to suck some clay out of the femoral artery because there was some distal embolic uh, involvement of the femoral vessels, so they did, they did a femoral embolectomy. During this process, uh, he went into ventricular fibrillation, uh, was defibrillated once, and transesophageal echo at that time, 
we've built a very typical picture of acute pressure overloaded right ventricle. So the right ventricle is, is um, let's go back to that, is um, severely dilated. It's going to run. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, so the RV is severely dilated. You've seen this nice paradoxical bouncing motion of the interventricular septum. The left ventricle is small and underfilled because it's been deprived of pulmonary blood flow. Very classic appearance of acute right ventricular pressure overload. Uh, the reason why you had this paradoxical embolus was because you had uh, a fairly decent sized PFO. This is left atrium over here, right atrium over here, and he's got uh, right to left uh, flow of blood through that due to his elevated pulmonary arterial pressures. So postoperatively, he was uh, heparinized. Uh, day three, he remained on ECMO support. His metabolic state improved. Three days later, he was re-imaged, uh, found that he had um, no um, uh, neurological defects on CT. He had a CTPA which showed significant residual pulmonary uh, embolization. He went on to have a surgical pulmonary embolectomy and closure of his VSD. And um, he made a rapid recovery from that, decannulated the next day, uh, had an IVC filter put in. And this was his echo post uh, decannulation. Uh, right ventricle is a lot happier. Uh, you've got normal left ventricular size and uh, much improved right ventricular systolic function. And to cut a long story short, this patient. Uh, was eventually discharged neurologically intact uh, with no major organ morbidity after about 100 days in hospital um, and no evidence of underlying malignancy. So really pretty spectacular save, I think. So what do the major international guidelines say about the role of ECMO in patients with massive pulmonary embolism? And this is where we start getting into the very small data phase of the talk. The the 2016 guidelines of the American College of Chest Physicians uh, recommend thrombolysis versus heparin as a first-line treatment in patients who've got massive pulmonary embolism. It's a fairly weak, low-level recommendation. Uh, in patients in, who um, have failed thrombolysis uh, have, or have some contraindication to it, they recommend uh, other extraction techniques, either open embolectomy or uh, some sort of catheter-based extraction technique. Or if the patient's rapidly deteriorating hemodynamically, they should go on to have some sort of extraction technique. They make absolutely no recommendation about uh, the role of ECMO in these patients at all. 2014 guidelines of the European um, Society of Cardiology. Uh, fairly similar recommendations in terms of thrombolysis. A somewhat stronger recommendation in favour of thrombolysis in these patients compared to heparin. Again, recommending uh, some extraction-based uh, technique, either surgical or catheter-based, if thrombolysis, thrombolysis fails, if there's some contraindication to it, or if the patient's starting to crash. And I made the comment that ECMO can be an effective procedure based on the small numbers of case reports and, and small case series, and that really is where the, where the small data problem is. There really is very little data to guide our practice in these patients. And to give you some sort of sense of that, uh, this was a meta-analysis of, of exactly 78 patients that was done uh, 2015, they reported overall survival of 70%, uh, cardiac arrest survival of uh, about 50%, and uh, in the series, uh, about a fifth of these patients were managed with uh, ECMO plus uh, heparin alone and had resolution of, of thrombus with that protocol. But these 78 patients actually comprised eight case series and, and uh, 11 in individual case reports, so very, very low quality data, prone to publication bias and um, and uh, not great. To date, um, the biggest single centre series that's been done has, been, has just been reported a couple of years ago from La Pitié in Paris. This is a very high volume ECMO centre that does about 300 cases a year. They collected 17 cases retrospectively. Um, and these are a very sick group of patients. There, uh, 15 of the 17 patients had had a cardiac arrest either preceding ECMO support or immediately beforehand. Um, and around seven of these patients were actually being massaged onto ECMO support um, uh, as a rescue therapy. Half of these patients had been thrombolyzed beforehand, so that was, they had failed thromb thrombolysis. Uh, the mean mean arterial pressure in this group was 40 millimeters of mercury. They were severely acidotic and had very high lactates. 
Uh, of these patients, only one patient went on to have a catheter-based extraction technique, another patient went to have a surgical embolectomy, and the remainder of uh, the 15 patients uh, just had heparin alone plus ECMO support. Severe bleeding was, was a very common complication in this patient group, but uh, the survival overall, overall was remarkably good, and this is actually long-term survival, uh, more than 90 days, and neurologically intact survival as well. So the, the long-term outcomes are actually remarkably good uh, in this group of patients. Almost half of them survived, despite being really very critically ill beforehand. So I think really the two main advantages of, of ECMO in patients with acute massive pulmonary embolus is that it provides and organ support while you figure out what, you can do, what you're going to do with the clot burden. So you've got control of the circulation, you can reverse the underlying metabolic abnormalities, the lactate comes down, kidney function starts to improve, you've got control of the hemodynamics. You can then work out whether you want to use, uh, do a surgical embolectomy or use a catheter extraction based technique or just maintain them on heparin and see what happens. The downsides are that uh, your hospital may not have it. Have it. Uh, it is uh, uh, invasive, of course, and it can cause major morbidity, uh, especially vascular morbidity. And I think that's really the key. Avoiding that sort of morbidity, I think, is really the key to making these programs work. And one of the biggest bugbears of venous arterial ECMO support is distal limb ischemia. And the way that you can prevent this is to put a second catheter uh, that's being fed off the arterial line. This is the venous line taking blood out of the patient here. This is the arterial line put, um, going back up towards the femoral artery. There's a second line coming off here that's, that's got a small catheter attached to it that's actually pushing blood back down the leg, providing distal flow through the um, femoral vessels. And getting this cannulation right at the outset just saves, saves you a world of pain moving forward because if you can get accurate cannulation of that back flow line, uh, soon after the patient's cannulated on ECMO, the, the um, subsequent management becomes much more straightforward. It's also critically important to actually monitor the flow in this backflow line. This is a flow probe that's attached to the line over here. Here we can see that we're getting 300 mils a minute down the, down the leg through the backflow cannula. And the other thing we do routinely is to measure the tissue saturation of the patient's calves. This is a nurse sensor that's more commonly used to measure, measure uh, cerebral oximetry. We put a sensor on the calf uh, because it's a venous weighted signal. Normal saturation is around 55-60%. So this is the calf saturation here, which is normal. And this is actually a very sensitive means of, of uh, detecting early uh, limb ischemia in these patients. And we haven't, had it, haven't uh, lost any patient's legs when we, uh, as long as we've been doing this um, uh, protocol. Another issue that's particular to uh, VA ECMO cannulation for uh, uh, pulmonary embolism is that if the patient's got residual um, deep venous thrombus, so this is a patient that's got a big thrombus sitting in the inferior vena cava over here, pushing a catheter up from below towards the right atrium as part of your ECMO cannulation runs a number of risks. You can actually dislodge this uh, embolus, push it right back up into the pulmonary circulation. Uh, it can include ECMO flow down at the, uh, the um, ECMO catheter. And if it's sitting close enough to the cannula, it can also cause hemolysis by creating a high, high uh, velocity flow around the cannula in, at that site. So if you know they've got um, a deep venous thrombus in that region, one option is to, to use an alternate cannulation strategy, which is to use the superior vena cava as your access port and return to the femoral artery. So I think... Although there's very little data to support the role of ECMO in, in um, massive pulmonary embolism, I think we are slowly accumulating experience with this technique. And I think the current consensus among the ECMO centers is that it is a reasonable alternative to, to systemic thrombolysis because it gives you, as I said, control of the circulation as a bridge to recovery with systemic heparinization. It's a bridge pre and post operatively in patients that are undergoing surgical embolectomy. And it's also bridged to catheter-based extraction techniques. Now, if the patient has been thrombolized already and then fails thrombolysis and needs venous arterial ECMO as a sort of a last, ditch, uh, uh, last resort um, treatment, it has a very, very high morbidity and mortality. Uh, case series, I put it up to 100% in some series. We've had two survivors that have had previous thrombolysis, but it is a very morbid thing to do to put a patient on venous arterial ECMO after, just after they've been thrombolized.
So I think the approach to ECMO is that it should be fairly pragmatic. I think that um, because there are a number of different tr treatment strategies available for the treatment of massive pulmonary embolism, they should be managed by a multidisciplinary team. I think having patients turn up in ED and then, given, been, then um, be given a big dose, dose of alteplase because that's the lo local protocol uh, does mean that all the other options are much more complicated and much more morbid. So I think before a patient thrombolyzes, there should be a discussion with a multidisciplinary team about what the best strategy will be. I think for a crashing patient, uh, venero arterial ECMO is, is the treatment of choice because if you've got control of the circulation, you can rapidly reverse uh, the underlying end organ dysfunction. But you've also got to be realistic. If you've got a patient that's, that's um, crashing in the middle of the night, becoming hemodynamically unstable, thrombolyzing that patient might be the best thing to do at that time. Uh, if the patient's uh, having the same problem in hours, a lot of people around, you've got exper expertise in an institution that's familiar with ECMO, can do it with low rates of morbidity, um, reliably and effectively. I think it's a reason, reasonable option to do that and then weigh up your other options uh, moving forward. Um, and I think we really do need to, to know or at least try to find out what our local experience is, pool our resources, pool our data. Um, these are low volume type cases that don't happen very often, but um, we still really don't know whether thrombolysis is the best initial step for these patients or whether we should be considering more invasive techniques like VA ECMO. Thank you.